operator. I am currently the director of the Barlow, I am currently the Barlow Family Director of the Vanderbilt Brain Institute. So we really house the neuroscience community here at Vanderbilt. I am a professor of pharmacology, psychiatry, and psychology. And I'm, decided, I'm absolutely delighted to host this event with uh, the School of Medicine Basic Science as part of the monthly series is called Lab to Table Conversations. And I think we have a really dynamic and timely discussion today on circadian rhythms. So I'm excited to actually share this time with three leading experts at Vanderbilt University and Vanderbilt University Medical Center in circadian rhythms research and medicine. Uh, Carl Johnson, the Cornelius Vanderbilt Professor of Biological Sciences, Beth Mallow, Division Chief of Sleep and the Professor of Neurology at the Vanderbilt University Medical Center, and Doug McMahon, the Stevenson's Professor of Biological Sciences. So our topic today is circadian rhythms. And circadian rhythms are our biological timekeepers. They helped us identify and really adapt to daily light and temperature cycles of the earth. Um, these rhythms control a myriad of mechanisms in the brain and in the body. And when they're dysregulated, they can actually lead to disease. So what is the science of circadian rhythms? How do we regulate them? How do they go dysregulated? What problems do those cause? And what about um, really the conversation on daylight savings time? How does this impact our rhythms, which there's been a lot of discussion over the past year in particular about this topic. So again, I'm excited for our panel today to really delve into these questions. Um, I wanna make one note, a housekeeping note. Please place any questions in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. We've received numerous questions during registration, as so we're gonna be answering as many of these questions as we can at the moderated discussion at the end of the session. So with that, I'm pleased to turn the conversation over to our panelists to let them introduce themselves and to give you just a little bit about their research. So if we could start, uh, Carl, do you wanna kick us off? Sure, yeah, it's, it's a real pleasure and an honor to be here. Uh, I've been working on biological rhythms since I was an undergraduate student, which as you can tell from my face, that was a long time ago. And I work on organisms from bacteria all the way up to humans. And I think that's an important point to make that biological rhythms are really right, completely ubiquitous uh, from bacteria, plants, bread mold, uh, animals, plants, and up to humans. And so uh, I've, I've got experience with that and I've, I've loved every minute of it. Oh, wonderful. Beth, how about yourself? Yeah, thank you. I also am really excited to be here today. I'm a clinician and a researcher at Vanderbilt Medical Center, and I think that understanding biological rhythms is just so key to understanding so many things about health and disease. I also have had the honor of testifying before Congress on Daylight Saving Time last March, uh, so I'm very excited about sharing that knowledge with folks. And I think it's a great conversation starter for learning more about uh, circadian rhythms. Wonderful. Thank you for being here, Doug. Well, thanks, Lisa. Yeah, it's it's great to be here. Um, and uh, yes, I'm a, a professor of biological sciences here at Vanderbilt. And uh, my laboratory has for a long time worked on uh, how biological rhythms, how our biological rhythms are synchronized or entrained to the environment by light, uh, how light, uh, seasonal light in particular, can affect our mental health. Uh, those have been our two areas of interest for a long time. And we do mostly work in mice uh, as, a, as an uh, uh, animal model, but we also use honeybees for some of our research. Great. Well, thank you. So Let's start. We've mentioned really the title of circadian rhythms. I gave sort of the textbook definition. But could one of you jump in and really for our audience, break down what are circadian rhythms and why should we care about them? What is this term that comes up in the popular press and how does it impact us? Well, maybe I could just kick that off for a minute. One of the things that's really amazing about the whole phenomenon is that uh, our daily timing is not based just on what is happening in the environment, but basically we can put humans or any organism really in conditions where they don't know what time of day it is, and they'll continue to elaborate a rhythm which will continue, usually with a period that's a little bit slower than 24 hours for humans, 
Um, and so we have it inside of us, this endogenous biological clock that keeps ticking. And what's normally happening uh, when we're in our usual environment is that every day we get our clock re-entrained, like Dr. McMahon was just mentioning. It's kind of like in the old days when we had wristwatches that didn't keep such great time. They would run a little slower, a little faster. Every morning when you woke up, you would actually reset the, the, your wristwatch to the, the clock on the wall. Your biological clock is a lot like that. So it has this endogenous and inherent capacity to oscillate even when they're not environmental cues. Mm -hmm. So with that, um, you know, Beth, as you study this, what do they regulate though? I mean, we, you know, as Carl, I, I, I like the analogy, what Carl just mentioned about your wristwatch where you just have to wind it. And we could say, well, you know, we're off by a few minutes here or a few minutes there and it's okay. And, you know, you knew with time it would continue to get a little worse, but you just adjust it. What, what about our bodies? How do our bodies respond to these types of changes? Right, so whenever there's a disconnect, we call it circadian misalignment is a fancy term for saying there's some sort of disconnect between our outside world and our bodies, um, things go awry. And that disconnect could be daylight saving time, but it can also be jet lag, it could be shift work. There's a variety of things that can be. And the what, there's lots of things that go awry, but just to keep it really simple, some of the hormones that we release, like melatonin, like cortisol, can be off. And we know those, those hormones are really important for sleep. We know that cortisol is really important for stress regulation. So we can have more stress uh, responses. We can have more inflammation in the body, which then can contribute to heart disease, obesity, stroke, a variety of other things. So really, really important that we stay aligned. So, um, so you, so let's unpack a couple of the concepts that you mentioned, but sort of backing up again, I want to go to the, like the very big end and sort of building on again, what Carl said. So if we, um, say without a clock, we're pretty much in a dark area, you know, maybe winter kind of isolated from the world around, it's just dark. And with that, you know, say we start to shift a little bit. Um, and so you're saying that this can have potential health consequences that can happen. And, you know, then when you throw in these other aspects of daylight savings, jet lag, they could probably be more um, severe. But what happens, um, you know, even with just small shifts that continue to happen, not just you get on a plane and suddenly you're jet lagged for a day, but let's talk about the sort of acute versus maybe more chronic. So in terms of these situations, for example, where you could find yourself shifted, you know, I'm kind of mentioning like sort of in a dark place, you just shift naturally, but say like shift workers, for example, where suddenly, you know, you do swing shifts, you may be going in the morning or in the afternoon, or you don't really know, it's a chronic condition. And so, you know, first of all, is there anything good that comes out of that in terms of your body and adapting but as you mentioned, there's hormones and other things that happen. So can you kind of talk a little bit more about some of these changes that can happen with this sort of constant uh, disrhythm, if you will? Yeah, I, I wish I could think of something good about shift work. It's hard, <laughs> it's hard to think about that because think about it, you're, you're constantly off kilter, you're off cycle with what's going on in your environment. I mean, I think that some people respond better. For example, younger people might, people with certain uh, circadian predispositions, whatever, but most of us are pretty vulnerable to that. And uh, it's, it's really, really hard on our systems. And people have linked, for example, shift work to breast cancer in nurses. And it's, it's really, really important to recognize that whenever we disrupt our cycles and we're not getting the light and the dark at the times that we should be getting them or we were getting them, uh, then our hormones and various other physiological processes go awry and it can activate, for example, these genes that can contribute to cancer or to inflammation, which as I mentioned, could then lead to uh, obesity, diabetes, heart disease. Uh, so I, I wish I could say something good about shift work. I just, I don't think it's very healthy for any of us. Okay. Well, I mean, there are things that we can do about shift uh, to help 
uh, people adapt to shift work. Usually in the industrial setting, people are on a rotating shift. And I agree with Beth, there's nothing good to say about it, especially when people first go on to a new shift. There's a lot of studies showing that injuries uh, are higher during that shift when people are readapting to the new shift, performance is down and things like that. But there are ways to try to help with uh, shift work, that is to try to maximize the amount of light that you get when you're on shift and minimize the amount of light that you're getting when you're off shift and sleeping in a very dark room uh, when you're uh, on shift work and uh, minimizing sound and things like that. So try to mimic as much as you can the normal light dark situation, even when you're on shift work. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned those, Carl. There are things that can be done. That's a great point. Yeah. I think one of the fascinating things about our clock system that contributes to this problem of adapting to different time zones or shift work is that we know its capacity to reset is limited to around an hour every day, right? So if you're on a rotating shift and you shift eight hours, it's going to take, you know, six, seven, eight days for your clock system to fully catch up. And in the meantime, your body functions are going to be quite uh, disrupted. And that's certainly true. We all experience that if we, you know, fly across time zones for jet lag as an acute thing. But the problem with shift work is that you're almost continuously in that state, right? Because your clock is never quite catching up. So, so we need, you know, one thing we can do is be gentle for our, be gentle to our clocks and only shift as much as we possibly can, which is about an hour a day, if we have that option, right? So kind of following up on that. So we, we sort of started with the chronic, right? The shift work and because many people have jobs that require shift, but kind of you now touched on something that, you know, happens to many people in terms of travel and jet lag. You have, you know, you're flying wherever and suddenly you're sort of skewed. So what can you do ahead of time to really sort of prepare to try and dampen this sort of shift that happens prior to, you know, boarding a flight, for example? Would one of you guys like to take that and then I can add? Well, I could just say that that uh, there's there's not a heck of a lot you can do beforehand unless you want to try to shift to the new phase before you travel, which sounds great. But, you know, we all have things to do before we travel and not very many of us are really disciplined enough to do that. OK, but if you are more power to you, go ahead and do that. Uh, I think the usual advice is to try to get to the new cycle and new conditions as rapidly as possible. Maximize your exposure to light on the new time. So you fly to Paris, get out there, even though you want to go to sleep, get out there and get that light and also be eating on the cycle of the new time because your eating and fasting cycle can also probably really help your whole body to come into the new phase. So your light exposure uh, and your feeding, trying to do that on the new phase uh, at the new time as quickly and as, as uh, conscientiously as possible will minimize the amount of time it takes you to go through jet lag, but it's not gonna eliminate it. Mm -hmm. Beth, anything to add on yeah, that? Yeah, I wanted to add just a few things. That was great. And I have to say, yeah, my husband and I kind of differ. You know, my version is to make these fancy charts and graphs and be all wonky and nerdy about it. He just like, we're going to have a good time. We're going to go. It's not a big deal. And so there's two different ways to approach travel and jet lag. And I guess it depends if you're a sleep specialist or not, right? If you're going to be more nerdy about it. I think the part that I, and I agree with everything you said, Carl, what I have struggled with is when I come home from Europe, for whatever reason, I do fine when I get there, I can adapt, maybe because I'm a morning person. But when I get home and I'm in clinic at three or four in the afternoon, and I want to go to sleep because I'm still on Europe time, oh my gosh, it is such a struggle. So all the things that we tell you not to do. Uh, like get exposed to lots of bright light late in the day actually are good, uh, you know, turning on my computer um, at seven o'clock at night so I can make it until nine o'clock or 10 o'clock at night and go to sleep. All those things um, are really, really helpful to me. Getting exercise in the late afternoon, getting exposed to bright light, drinking a little bit of caffeine, just to kind of push me over. Because if I try to go to bed 
when I want to, which is six o'clock at night after I've been in Europe for a couple of weeks, uh, what will invariably happen is I'll wake up at two or three in the morning and not be able to go back to sleep. Uh, so uh, I think that there are some, I'll put an article that I really love in the chat about traveling the world with jet lag or with minimizing jet lag. And you can read about some of the things that Carl and I mentioned. Does it, um, this is a very naive question, but are people more prone, as you just sort of mentioned, going one way or the other in terms of jet lag? Yeah, it depends on your biological clock in a way. So as a morning person, I do really, really well when I go to Europe. Um, but uh, when I come home, I really struggle and the night owls actually do better. Uh, so depending on what you are, whether you're more of a tendency to be what we call morning larks and get up early, or whether you're more of a night owl will affect how you um, manage jet lag. Okay, so there's no real general theme. It really just depends on the individual is what it sounds like. A lot of individual variability. Age can play um, a role too. Yeah, Doug, do you want to add to that? Yeah. Well, I was just going to say there is a lot of individual variability. Overall, if you look at the population, it tends to be that our biological clocks, as he, our human biological clocks, can shift a little bit easier and farther each day in the delay direction, traveling west, if you will. And they tend to come up short a little bit, shifting on daily basis for traveling east or phase advancing. So that's, that's a sort of overall generality, but there's a lot of individual variability as whose clock shifts easier in one direction or another. Right, yeah. and, and I followed up on what Dr. Biman just said, I just wanna also mention that there've been studies done on professional sports teams that have to fly back and forth east and west coast uh, to play. So then now here's not, not a situation of going to Europe and looking forward to going to the museums or things like that. This is a real performance issue and that teams that have to fly east to play tend to do worse than teams that don't have to fly or teams that fly west. Teams that fly west tend to do all right, but teams that have to fly east and so they have to phase advance are at a, uh, at a disadvantage actually. So remember that when you're betting on your sports teams. Uh, and just following up on what uh, Dr. Mallow was just mentioning about her her uh, own feeling that when she goes to Europe, she doesn't really have as much trouble as when she comes home. I think that's partly because we humans are very psychologically effective, okay? When I'm flying to Europe to go to a scientific meeting or to go on a vacation, I'm excited to be in a new place. I, you know, I want to get it. I want to go do things. This is great. But when I'm coming home, it's all of this work that's piled up on my desk that I have to get to. And so it really pulls me down. It's a psychological thing. We call that phenomenon uh, masking, which we see even in other in organisms, lower organisms, that uh, the things beyond just the clock, in our internal clock and just the environment influence the way in which things get expressed. And in this case, it's a kind of the psychological component about being excited versus not being excited about where you've gone to. Yeah, yeah, that's very exciting. And so, um, so it's interesting. We talked about like sort of this chronic, and we sort of started a, a little bit now about the acute aspects. And with that, um, you know, we sort of touched on in the very beginning. I think Beth did about if you know too much disruption of your circadian rhythm can cause disease. And so. Could we delve into that just a little bit more? I know you mentioned, Beth, you know, things about hormones, cortisol, but sort of for our audience, can you break it down a little bit more? What happens if you're in this chronic situation or, you know, these acute where you're constantly traveling back and forth? There's a lot of businessmen that travel all over that, you know, spend more time nearly on a plane than off during a day. So what happens with chronic disruptions and implications for disease? Yeah, I think it's a great question. Uh, I think that the, the simplest way to think of it is that our, our bodies are just off when we travel, for example, more than an hour, as, as Doug and Carl said, um, we kind of exceed the capacity of our bodies to be in sync with our environment. And, and I actually think that I want to make a distinction between jet lag and daylight saving time. 
because uh, I think it's really important to the discussion today. So with jet lag, as long as we're only dealing with an hour, you know, maybe two hours, we, we can compensate pretty quickly within a day, for example. It's not a big deal. But what because happens- again, it's acute. Right. Thing. Right, it's acute, but then the, the, the point I wanna make with the with when we go to daylight saving time in March is what happens is we're not changing our light, we're just changing our clock. So when we, we travel from, let's say, um, Chicago to Washington DC or Nashville to Boston or whatever, is we're changing both the light and the clock. And it's that light that gets us resynchronized because that's the strongest signal that our bodies have mm -hmm. uh, to get us back aligned. So as long as we're not doing something too extreme, we can keep up. But when we do something like daylight saving time, we're not changing the light, we're just changing the clock. And actually we have this natural experiment in this country where for almost eight months of the year, we're off cycle or we're off kilter or we're uh sync you know we're uh desynchronized uh where our clocks are an hour off for most of the year and okay. the light doesn't follow yeah. and that has major health implications so yeah so we sort of jumped ahead to daylight savings time um so let's go ahead and move on to there because i really want to set it up first about just the idea of how circadian clocks by you know trial things that we think about can disrupt because we experience jet lag or shift work or things along those lines but you know as you mentioned daylight savings time has really become a topic that's received a lot of attention um part of this has been about really the debate of should we change it I mean, this spring forward in this uh, spring and fall back, we're getting ready here soon to sort of enter, um, you know, the normal sort of time, if you will. Um, but there's a lot of debate about that. And uh, part of that debate is if you ask people in general, what would they prefer? Many people would say, well, I'd like for it to be light in the evening after work, it's great. I can, you know, be outside more. Um, I can go out shopping. It's there's a strong economic aspect to this of having people outside. But in the debate that really has happened, and a lot of this has come from really the debate that started in Congress, um, it really seemed like a lot of individuals that study circadian rhythms and sleep were on the other side of the aisle, where they were really arguing something different. And so, could we kind of get your thoughts on this and really? What was the sort of perspective of if we're going to do something, it shouldn't be daylight savings time? Right. Well, most Americans, thank you for that question. And uh, how hopefully as we talk about this, we'll get back to your wanting to, uh, to really connect these to circadian rhythms and sleep. I know that's, that's mm -hmm. very important for you in this audience. Uh, what's going on nationally right now is most Americans do not want to go back and forth. We're tired of it. We're, we're tired of switching our clocks twice a year and it's very disruptive. A lot of parents find that their kids are dysregulated and they're just, they're just more irritable and frustrated and everybody just wants to stop going back and forth. And, and people have actually done national polls and found that the majority of Americans want to stop this practice. The challenge is, where do we land? And some of the polls, people want to go to the permanent standard time, which is what we'll be on um, November 6th for several months, where we turn our clocks back and it's kind of more aligned with our natural light. Some people want to go to permanent uh, daylight time. As you said, uh, Lisa, the, there is, there are advantages, I'll agree, to um, being able to shop later in the day or pick up that gallon of milk when it's still light outside. Um, but, or, go, or go play golf. Or play golf. Uh, you know, it's interesting about the exercise. People are finding that even though you get light in the afternoon in the summer, it can be really, really hot in the afternoon, especially with climate change. So people are actually finding that 
some of the advantages of that afternoon light that you get with daylight saving time are not as apparent as they used to be. Uh, and people are sometimes preferring to exercise in the morning, which is, is maximized with your permanent standard time. You get more light in the morning with permanent standard time. You get more light in the late afternoon and evening with the daylight saving time. But the point that I wanna get back to is that there is a lot of debate. Um, the health community, uh, as well as researchers, uh, biological rhythms, this is where the sleep and the, the circadian rhythm communities have really come together and said, this is permanent standard time where you get more light in the morning is the healthy choice. And we should just get rid of going back and forth and go to permanent standard time. On the flip side, uh, permanent daylight time, daylight saving time, where we would stay kind of an hour off all year long, you know, have that extra hour in the afternoon and evening, has been endorsed by groups like the National Sports Association or um, Sporting Goods Association and the National Association of Convenience Stores. So anything that has to do with commerce uh, tends to support that late afternoon, early evening. Um, and that's where the debate lies. And um, there's lots of legislation going on in, in all the different states. And even this is a worldwide issue. I think somebody put in the questions and answers that Mexico is recently going uh, to permanent standard time. So that's pretty exciting. And there's just a lot of debate, not just in this country, but in the European Union and other countries. And um, it's a really interesting dilemma. If you can roll out of bed at eight o'clock or nine o'clock, it's not gonna affect you as much as if you're an essential worker um, who has to be at work at 6 a.m. and you want that light in the morning to get you going, wake you up, keep your biological rhythm synchronized and um, you know, schools, that's the other thing. These school kids, especially our teenagers who have to wake up early because their school starts early are really struggling. And bringing this back, I I'll say one more thing. I wanna get Carl and Doug's points as well. Um, but bringing it back, Lisa, to the this idea of what's going on in our bodies and our brains. I think this is a really good example because what happens with the permanent standard time is you get your light in the morning. And what does light do? It wakes us up, it gets us going. It actually makes it easier to go to sleep at night because it, 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 it synchronizes our circadian rhythms and makes it easier to go to sleep at night. And then if we have light too late at night, like when I was in Michigan, we had to wait until after July 4th to have our fireworks because we were on the Western edge of the, the Eastern time zone. That can suppress our, our natural melatonin levels, that late evening light, and that can interfere with sleep. And people who live on those Western edges of the time zones actually have been shown to get less sleep than those um, who are, are more on the, um, the Eastern edges. So for example, living in Michigan, compared to living in Chicago, you get less sleep, you have less economic productivity, um, there's more rates of cancer. Uh, so there really are health effects um, to this uh, debate and this decision going on. And I hope that the health uh, community wins out over the, not that shopping isn't important, I love to shop, but, and I know it seems like fun to have that afternoon, evening light, you know, late afternoon, evening light, for part of the year, but I do hope the health uh, community wins this debate. Yeah, well, if I could uh, add to what Beth said, I think it's kind of interesting to think about how did this thing get started in the first place? <laughs> okay, <laughs> and the answer to that is that it was actually World War I and World War II, different initiatives to try to save energy well, was the idea of starting to switch back and forth between daylight savings time and standard time. However, a study that Time Magazine did on Indiana, which I think switched their policy in 2006 or something like that, indicated that actually there wasn't any energy savings by si switching back and forth. In fact, it may even be slightly more energy expended by shifting back and forth between these two things. So 
while I personally don't think it's such a big deal for this one hour shift from a health point of view in terms of uh, health problems being initiated, I do think it just, why the heck are we doing this, you know, and ab and uh, abolishing the switch, switching back and forth is important. And what Beth is talking about is should we stick with daylight savings time or with standard time? And from the biological and the health point of view, the answer is clearly standard time wins out. Yeah, I'll just I'll just add, you know, from the one area I study related to health, that is light and mental health, right? Aligning light exposure more toward the morning, even if it's only an hour, is uh, can be a powerful uh, factor of mood and of, uh, of mental health in general. And so uh, from that point of view, also sticking with standard time all the time uh, would be better for health. In, in fact, Doug, just uh, what can you enlarge on that just a little bit to talk about the usual phototherapy for seasonal affective disorder? Oh yeah, thank you, Carl. That's a good point. Is that you know that's an extrapolation of data developed by people who um, are treating seasonal affective disorder or winter depression using light. And what they found was morning light was much more effective than evening light. If you're going to add light to someone's schedule, where was it the most important elevator of mood? Where was it the most important elevator of serotonin and uh, chemicals in the brain that signal mood? And that's morning light, right? So that, that would be an extrapolation of that work. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, um, you know, I think that makes a lot of sense. I think also then, you know, sort of the takeaway is you want to wake up when there's light or soon to have light. That's mm -hmm. what's important. So that's sort of morning light. And you can, you know, think about that as you, you know, it, it's a very logical idea how you've laid it out. Kind of going to the converse of that, though, you know, what about like going to sleep? There's, you know, people, can you kind of put this in the scientific um, reasoning or rationale of why they tell you, you know, don't watch TV or screen times before you go to bed? Um, really the biology behind that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, light, sunlight is going to be even stronger than the light from your video games or your TV or whatever. It's natural light. And what happens is we release melatonin about two to three hours before we're ready to go to sleep. And light is suppressed by melatonin. So we don't release melatonin until it's dark outside. And we need that melatonin to our natural melatonin to fall asleep. And the teenagers are particularly susceptible because what happens when we go through puberty is everything shifts and our melatonin um, gets delayed by about two to three hours. And teenagers are also even more exquisitely sensitive to that light um, suppression of melatonin than um, the rest of us. So our teenagers, especially if they have to wake up early for school, are really struggling because they're they're um, not able to go to sleep on time and then they have to um, wake up early for school. So I think they're probably, along with our essential workers who have to open up our grocery stores or whatever at six in the morning, they are, the teenagers are, are some of our most vulnerable uh, when it comes to the, um, the, the clock time shift. So uh, I had always heard this, and I guess this sort of kind of follows up, but again, trying to make it a little more practical. So, you know, not having screen time, computers, phones, that sort of um, modern technology lighting isn't great because again, you want dark melatonin. Say in the middle of the night, you wake up and you go to get a drink of water. What does just turning on that light for two minutes do? You know, it's very much a normal habit, but now what does that do in terms of your sleep? And, you know, what should you do? I guess is the most um, easy question in terms of everyday health and how we're really thinking about circadian rhythms and, you know, trying to like really be on the best schedule for our body. Well, I think a lot has to do with how much light and uh, in terms of the intensity of it and the duration. If you get up and you turn on just a little bit of light and drink some water, something like that, probably not going to be a big deal. 
But if you have a really bright light and it's on there for 30 minutes and something like that, it'll suppress your melatonin in the middle of the night and it'll have these impacts that Dr. Mal is talking about. Right, or if you read on, read on your iPad or, or watch a two hour movie, right, on your TV, I mean, amazingly, we have specialized nerve cells in our eyes that are directly wired to our biological clock system and signal our biological clock whenever the light is on. And they are much more sensitive to blue light than other parts of the spectrum. So if you're getting um, intense light that has a lot of blue in it, uh, like a TV screen or your iPad, then you're stimulating your biological clock and other parts of your brain that have to do with alerting. So you're going to have uh, more trouble falling back asleep. Uh, and also, you may have shifted your clock if you do this for long enough and bright enough, right? So you may have actually delay your clock and delay the time that you get up in the morning uh, or your body would want to. So regulating that um, screen time at night or some, you know, lots of our devices now have these automatic programs that take the blue out of the screen. You see your computer screen sort of turning orange <laughs> at night. That's an attempt at minimizing the impact of that screen time on your sleep and circadian rhythms. Yeah, um, my, my little... little trick is I have a little flashlight by my, my phone, very dim by my uh, bed. So if I have to think of something in the middle of the night, because otherwise you're lying awake trying to remember what you just thought you have to do tomorrow. But if you know, I have a little notepad and I could just take a little pen light, write down what I think, what's on my mind, and then go right back to sleep. I find that really helps. But as a doctor, as a sleep doctor, I try not to obsess too much about it with my patients. I think Carl makes a really good point. We don't want to, we don't want people to think, oh my gosh, I turn on the light and it's all over. I've lost it. I'm going to be a basket case tomorrow. You'll probably be fine. Uh, yeah, I think that just small doses of light to use the bathroom or whatever better than we don't want to trip and fall right uh, in the middle of the night. But I think the point being that you don't want to, you know, for example, say you have insomnia, you get up, it's going to be more difficult because you can't sleep turning on the light. So we have to be conscious of the light. So kind of taking this back to this point, we talked a lot about, you know, if you have the screen time, this can disrupt falling asleep because of melatonin, the importance of it, you know, in the middle of the night, you turn on the lights in the middle of the night for a while that could disrupt again, melatonin. So can you just take melatonin and get back in sync like quickly? Like what is, what are sort of the thoughts on melatonin? Because a lot of people take it with the idea it's gonna make them fall asleep quickly, help with jet lag, all sorts of things. So sort of like, it's a big question, but what are your thoughts on this? Where does melatonin play a role in this in terms of exogenous or taking it, not just what's endogenously happening? Well, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let uh, Dr. Mallow really talk about this because she's done a lot of work with this, but I'll just say that for me personally, taking melatonin to go to sleep or especially for jet lag it helps me to go to sleep, but I wake up again very shortly after that if, if it's a jet lag situation. Uh, but I, I think clinically with some of the populations that Dr. Uh, Mal is working with, that it may well be an effective thing. So, you know, what do you think about that, Beth? Yeah, I, I personally think natural melatonin is the best uh, you can do, but you mean you're naturally produced melatonin, you're natu right? Exactly. You're naturally producing like anything else, right? Like the food we eat is probably better than the multivitamin. If we have to choose between the two mm -hmm. with that said, I, I do appreciate that Carl. I, I see a lot of kids and adults uh, on the autism spectrum and that plus ADHD. Um, and then of course, people who, who have shift work jet lag, um, who are have we something called the late sleep phase where they go to bed late um, and they they wake up late. They really do benefit from melatonin. And and I know there's a lot in the news right now about the um, the dangers of melatonin. And I, I actually think it's fairly safe as long as you work with a reputable brand. So I do feel there are um, definitely clinical populations, particularly those with autism um, and ADHD who really do benefit from melatonin. 
And I just, I want it to be under the direction of um, a doctor, if not a sleep specialist, at least your primary care or your pediatrician. Um, make sure there are no other medicines that it could be interacting with. Um, make sure you're not overlooking some other medical condition like sleep apnea. Um, but in general, it's, it's fairly safe. And I know a lot of these, there's a lot of very strong sleep aids that have a lot of side effects. And then of course, people are now turning to CBD and TH, you know, to marijuana and other, all lots of other things. And I would rather <laughs> they take the melatonin uh, than these. And, and what's your usual advice to take melatonin a couple of hours before the uh, preferred bedtime? Is that the idea? If, if it's for falling asleep and you're feeling like you're using it as a hypnotic to try to fall asleep, usually 30 minutes beforehand coupled, 30 minutes before the bedtime you want, coupled with relaxation, something behavioral, reading a book, reading a boring book, whatever, because it's always going to work better. Just like in psychiatry, combining therapy with medication is, is better than one of, one of them alone. So melatonin plus behavioral strategies to promote sleep, turning off the phones, of course. Uh, that's to me when you would do that. But if somebody's got delayed sleep phase where they're routinely going to bed at two in the morning or you're using it for, um, for jet lag, you do wanna use it earlier um, to kind of reset your biological clock. And what I'll recommend actually is maybe a small dose, like a half a milligram, uh, three to five hours before the preferred bedtime. And then I'll couple it with a three milligram dose 30 minutes before bedtime uh, to really get the most bang for your buck with the melatonin. Thank you. No, I think that's very helpful. So we we briefly touched upon, you know, again, this idea of melatonin, light, circadian rhythms in school children. You know, again, it's not great to wake up in the dark, to go to school in the dark. We need light. This is important. And as you mentioned, um, you know, adolescents, teenagers in particular, are very vulnerable. So what about the sort of age-specific effects? What other populations may be, um, you know, are there populated age, like, you know, as you get older or more midlife, stressful situations? What can sort of you know, maybe impact that sort of circadian rhythm, which can then impact perhaps sleep and other things. Could someone speak to that a little bit? Um, I can, but Doug or Carl, if you wanted to take yeah. that. Hey, Doug, do you want to yeah. uh, jump in? Yeah, sure. So certainly our circadian rhythms tend to change with age, uh, with the idea of our, we, we get an earlier phase, we tend to wake up earlier, Go to bed earlier, right? <laughs> so when we're older. <laughs> we're older, right? And certainly that's something that I'm experiencing. <laughs> and also our sensitivity to light also tends to decrease in part because we may have changes in the lenses of our eyes and things like that with age that are filtering out some of the wavelengths that we used to get. Uh, and that also there's evidence that our clocks themselves may be less, a little bit less able to shift and also a little bit less robust at driving our physiological processes. So the connections of our clock, both to the outside world through light and internally to drive things, maybe get a little bit weaker with age. So that's why we tend to have these, you know, earlier and less uh, robust sleep-wake rhythms when we age, right? We're taking naps and so on, where before we might have more consolidated sleep when we were young. And that's probably true of our, our other bodily rhythms. As well. No, that's a great answer because we, you know, we all know as you get older, you hear about waking up early. And I think you just gave a really great overview of why that happens, which is important, um, you know, to sort of think about because these are natural processes. Just mm -hmm. because we sort of are waking up, it doesn't mean something's wrong. Again, very natural. And as you mentioned, just the sensitivity to light. Mm -hmm. So with that, um, what about, and it's sort of linking this in a different way, but how, what role does stress play? I mean, stress, how does that intersect with circadian rhythms? Is there, you know, um, a real link? Because often stress can come in, um, you know, not always, but there can be a high comorbidity of stress, say with depression. Um, mm -hmm. They don't always go hand in hand. And um, there's discussions and literature I know about circadian rhythms being disrupted with a number of different disorders, both 
ones that um, impact the whole body as well as the brain. But since I'm the director of the Brain Institute, I'm going to ask you to kind of focus in a little bit more on maybe some of the uh, neurological and psychiatric conditions in what happens, again, with sort of this disruption of of circadian rhythms, can stress diseases play a role in this and triggering it? Or do you think the circadian is also driving it? Like what, how are we sort of viewing this intersection? Okay, I guess I can start. So, you know, interestingly, our circadian clock actually is a strong regulator of our stress response, right? That there, our circadian clock makes that there's a daily rhythm in our stress hormone, cortisol, that's uh, actually driven off our circadian clock. And then on top of that rhythm, we can have individual stress events. Um, so it's, it, there's a very strong tie between our circadian clock and the stress system. And then in the other way around, right, stress and uh, specifically disruption of our sleep-wake or circadian rhythms is definitely associated with lots of different um, negative health effects, both in mental health and, and lots of other physiological effects that have to do with disruption of our circadian system by stress. And I don't know, maybe Dr. Mallow can elaborate a little bit more on those since she's a you know, medical doctor, but uh, maybe that would be the best way to go. Hmm? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, it's a great question. I think that uh, the way I view it is that whenever there's a stress, I think of cortisol also, although I, I'd love to hear from you guys about any other um, biological hormones or, or biological chemicals that may be playing a role, but I, my go-to is cortisol. And I know that, um, the model that we talk a lot about in, in autism and ADHD, but I think it applies to any of us is that as the day goes on, you know, we should, our cortisol levels should fall at night so that we can go to sleep. But what happens, um, in stress uh, think about kids with meltdowns, for example, or any of us when we're we're ir ir irritable or whatever, uh, or we read too much of the news, right? Uh, we get increased cortisol as the day goes on. So we don't get that normal fall in cortisol that we should get at night that will then allow us to go to sleep. So that can disrupt sleep. And then what can happen in, in sleep is if we aren't sleeping well at night, if we have insomnia, we can again have too much cortisol and then we start the day dysregulated. Um, so that's how I think of it. It's almost like a vicious cycle with the cortisol. And I'm sure it's very simplistic. That's how I explain it to patients. But um, I know there are other um, hormones as well that, that are affected by the circadian uh, cycle. Um, Carl may, may want to elaborate on that, but that's how I think of it as um, the interplay between uh, stress, cortisol, and circadian rhythms. So actually, I want to jump in for a second. Um, so based on what you said, uh, you know, we talk a lot about cortisol and we think about stress. That was really where the question came from. But having, you know, especially more chronic dysregulated circadian rhythms, and we talk a lot about disease, we've mentioned, you know, mental illness, but it can have just a basic effect on, you know, for example, gaining weight and metabolism. So why is that? I mean, Carl, maybe could you jump in on that? Yeah, thank you, Lisa. I really appreciate your uh, asking that question because I alluded to earlier, like when we do the jet lag thing, that light and melatonin are really key. But uh, when we eat and when we fast is also really important. So the fact that the circadian clock in us is regulating so many things, one of the things it's regulating is metabolism, by which I mean whether we're burning sugars versus burning fats and things like that. And so when we think about weight maintenance and going into metabolic syndrome and diabetes and things like that, we think about how much we eat and how much uh, uh, exercise we get. But another component that's kind of not so well recognized is when we eat. Since the clock is controlling metabolism to be rhythmic, when we eat and when we metabolize the food uh, is really important. And so research from my lab and a number of other labs in the country, this is kind of a hot topic now. And one of the things that we found and other people have found is that if you're eating uh, a good breakfast, lunch and dinner, and then fasting from your supper all the way to the following breakfast, 
what that means is that you go to bed with a relatively empty stomach and you go immediately during your sleep episode into a good fat burning mode, which helps you to kind of get rid of some of that fat, helps you to maintain your weight. On the other hand, if you eat late at night, which a lot of us do, myself included sometimes, you know, um, uh, eating a lot of potato chips in front of the TV or something like that, where we go to bed with food in our stomach where there's carbohydrates and sugars there, they're a lot easier to metabolize when we go to sleep. In that situation, it delays us going into the fat burning mode and we don't as effectively uh, metabolize our fat. And so it can lead to an accumulation of fat. And so that is another kind of underappreciated factor when we think about our circadian clocks. Mm -hmm. So what would be sort of, um, if you had to ideally, and I'm going to direct this to Beth, since she's a clinician on the panel, of sort of when should you eat? When I, like how, how soon? Like, you know, everybody defines soon in a different way. What would be ideal in terms of what Carl was talking about for your metabolism and really getting the best out of, you know, hopefully a good night's sleep. Everything is in check with your body rhythms. Yeah, I've tried this intermittent fasting and it just doesn't work for me. I wish, because I, I struggle as many of us who are um, getting older, I guess we're all getting older do. Uh, I, what I find is that- uh, Beth, Beth, can you define what you mean by intermittent fasting? Cause that sometimes is used- Yeah, for no, no, I'm glad you, you bring that up. Um, what I mean is based on what you're saying about trying not to eat at night, people have actually extended that to say, some people say have an eight hour window, some some people even go more extreme than that, have a six hour window. For me, what I try to do, I, I wake up seven o'clock. I feel like by 8 a.m. I need to eat. But what I do try to do is I try to stop eating by 8 p.m. or possibly 7 p.m. so that I give myself that, um, that window at night. And I advise that to my patients as well, especially I see a lot of people, for example, with sleep apnea who really, you know, even after we treat them with CPAP or whatever, they're still struggling with weight um, from all the years that they had a sleep disorder that was untreated. So I recommend people, uh, as you're saying, Carl, I agree with everything you said, like if they can go to bed um, with an empty stomach, not to the point that it's going to keep them from sleeping, because if they're really hungry, it's going to keep them up at night. But if you can eat dinner and then just stop and don't eat after seven o'clock or eight o'clock at night and then be able to get through the night um, and wake up at seven or eight and then you can have your breakfast. For me, that's what works. And what I what I try to avoid and I tell my patients to avoid is to not be snacking all night. Don't snack at nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night because that is not gonna be very healthy for your sleep, it's going to contribute to weight gain. Um, so that that's the best advice that that I can give folks. Um, if you can do the eight hour, you know, put all your calories in between, I don't know, 10 a.m. and 6 p.m., that's great. It's just not going to work for everyone. What about, um, so this metabolism is important. And of course, that comes a lot with when your meals, when you're eating. What about physical exercise? Is there an optimal time to do it? Some people love to get up in the morning and exercise. Other people like to do it later because it says they it tires them out and then they can sleep. What it what is is there a like any exercise is better than none? I think we would all agree. But in terms of you know, as the experts here on the panel of circadian rhythms, what do you think? I think. I'll just jump in because I love to exercise. I I think anytime except right before bed. So I would say before dinner, you're going to be fine. Early in the morning, you're going to be fine. Some of us on days that I can work from home, I actually will crank out a grant or paper writing and then go for a run at 11 in the morning as kind of a mental break if the weather suits it. Of course, with climate change and all, a lot of us over the summer are finding we have to exercise earlier in the day uh, because we want to watch out for heat stroke and extreme heat and all of that uh, too late in the in the day. But I think it's really individual. Um, I think the time I would avoid exercise would be too close to that time. So I would say, and you don't want to exercise after dinner anyway, you know, on a on a full stomach. So I would say. 
any time before dinner or earlier in the day, depending on your individual needs and what's going on with the temperature outside. You want to follow up on that, Doug? Sure. So I, I think I, I agree with Beth. Whenever you can establish a routine to, to get regular exercise, that's great. Probably not right before bed because that might be disruptive. But other than that, whenever you can fit it in and do it regularly is the, is the great time. If you're an athlete and you're looking to maximize performance, then there are lots of good studies that would say across, broadly across the early afternoon and evening near our body temperature maximum, we tend to have our maximum athletic capabilities, you know, to put forth uh, athletic effort. Uh, for most of us, that doesn't matter because we're not looking to set any records, but uh, <laughs> if you're a swimmer or something and looking to better your time, the time to swim. Right. Well, that brings up a, a really interesting point. And that is that there have been studies of swim performance as a function of the time of day uh, mm -hmm. and uh, Olympic times and things like that. And those all max out uh, best performance in the middle of the middle to late afternoon when, as Dr. McMahon says, your body temperature is high. And in the morning, it's not such a great time because we're warming up uh, from our sleep episode. And also, as I, we, I think we can all appreciate that we need to to warm up our bodies in the morning to to avoid pulling, you know, uh, getting a, a a cramp or something like that. So uh, you need to be a little careful about that. But if you do ramp it up in the morning, that's fine too. You, but it won't be your maximal performance. Right. Yeah. No, I think that's all good advice. Um, what other things can we do? Like we talked about this, what can just regulate our circadian rhythms, and you know, it's sort of like this discussion of you know, trying to avoid screen time before bed, eating before bed, you know, having bright light in the middle of the night, um, really trying to be more in tune to the light outside, if you will, which can differ as we, as was discussed by Beth, really where you are in the time zone, but trying to align. What else can we do to really sort of keep ourselves in rhythm? I mean, it's not just things go wrong, but how do we maintain good circadian regulation of our body that hopefully improves our overall health? Well, I think I think consistency is the key, and that is that you know try to establish habits where you're waking up about the same time every day of the week and going to bed every day of the week. Uh, and uh, there's a there's a phenomena that we call social jet lag that a lot of people will sleep uh, late Saturday morning or and possibly Sunday morning whatnot. And effectively, they're putting themselves through a jet lag situation every week when they do that. And of course, of course, it's really attractive to sleep late on Saturday morning or Sunday morning when we don't have some of the same obligations we have in the week. But we're effectively shifting the phase of our clock, which then puts us into this bad situation. So social jet lag is something to be avoided. And consistency from day to day all the way through the week is kind of really the key to that and the key to getting good sleep, too, I think. No, that's really good advice. I haven't heard that term before, but I like that. Social justice. Very good. Very good. Yeah. So um, I, would, I, would agree, go I would agree and just add that um, really that exposure, regular exposure to outdoor light, which we don't sense it, but it's so much brighter than indoor light, even on a cloudy day like today. It's much brighter outside than it is in our offices. And that really helps keep our circadian rhythms in line and help our sleep as well. Right. The Industrial Revolution and indoor artificial lighting has had a major deleterious effect upon our biological clocks as compared with when we were farmers or ranchers or whatever and being outdoors all day long. Exactly. Beth, any other advice you can offer? Is there anything else people should keep in mind that, uh, you know, just to promote overall good health and trying to keep their circadian rhythms in check? I just wanted to stress the exercise. It really does help. Uh, exercise, Carl brought up um, when we eat. I also want to mention social interactions. It gets, it's getting a lot of attention with dementia and Alzheimer's disease. You know, the importance of, of social uh, interactions for keeping us on a consistent biological clock. Uh, all of that is really, really important. Wonderful. 
Well, with that, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap up. I'd like to uh, thank our panel today. These are really just phenomenal, phenomenal researchers that I am delighted to work with here at Vanderbilt University. I'd like to thank Carl Johnson, Beth Malino, and Doug McMahon for really wonderful, wonderful insight and for really sharing their expertise today. Um, I'd also like to thank the School of Medicine Basic Science for inviting uh, me here to moderate this and to really share expertise uh, from Vanderbilt on circadian rhythms. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and wish you all a wonderful day. Um, there will be a link sent out about this episode if any of you'd like to rewatch it. And you can also reach out to any of us uh, on uh, the Vanderbilt uh, website. You can just go plug in our names if you have an individual questions that you'd like to know. I know in particular, uh, Dr. Mallow, since she sees patients or Doug or Carl, they have tremendous expertise. And we really didn't even go into the whole rhythmicity of things like honeybees and housing cycle, which is so incredibly exciting. So with that, thank you all. And we wish you a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take